Okay, everybody. Today we're going to、uh, go through the chapter five. So in chapter one to three, we have learned something about motion, including one-dimensional motion and two-dimensional motion. And in chapter four, we have learned something about Newton's laws, which is a bridge to connect the motion and the force. So here. We're going to apply Newton's laws to solve some problems. Okay, now let's go to the chapter. So we'll first skip the、uh, quick test. You can do it by yourself. So first of all, let's learn what is equilibrium. We say that an object at rest is in a static equilibrium. Okay, so first of all, let me change my、uh, cursor to be a pen. So when something is at rest, we call this is equilibrium, and this is、uh, stat static equilibrium. When an object is moving in a straight line at a constant speed, let's see this. Then we call it in a dynamic equilibrium. So here, we introduce equilibrium, and we introduce two types of equilibrium. The first equilibrium is static equilibrium. The second one is dynamic equilibrium. So in both types of equilibrium, there's no net force acting on the object. Okay. So because do you remember the Newton's first law? It states that if there's no net force acting on an object, this object will either be at rest or in a、uh, uniform motion, which is number one here and number two here. This means at rest. This means uniform motion. Because it's constant speed in a straight line, so either number one or number two condition, it means、um, the object is in uh, uh, Newton's first law condition. There's no net force. Okay, so that's just two definitions. And、um, if an object is in equilibrium, no matter it's static equilibrium or dynamic equilibrium. Then we can say the net force is zero, and we can say the net force on x-axis is zero, and the、uh, net force on y-axis is also zero. Okay. Now let's see one example to solve some problem. An orangutan weighing five hundred newton. Hands from a vertical rope. What's the tension in the rope? So first of all, what's the status of the orangutan? Is it in equilibrium? Yes or no? If it is in equilibrium, so which type of equilibrium is it? We have two types of equilibrium: static. And dynamic equilibrium. So, which type of equilibrium is this orangutan、um, be、um, being right now? Okay, the answer is static because now it's at rest, so it's static equilibrium. If it's in equilibrium, no matter it's static or dynamic equilibrium. The net force should be zero. Now let's see.、Um, let's make a free body diagram. So how many forces are there exerted on the orangutan? Two. The number one force is always weight. The second force, it's tension. And we know the net force is zero, and there are only two forces. So these two forces should balance each other. So the T. Equals to weight. 
So if the weight is 500 Newton, then what is the magnitude of tension force? It should be 500 Newtons too. And what's the direction of this tension force? Of course, it's going up, which is um, opposed to the weight. Okay, so here is a way of solving such problem. So T equals to weight, it equals 500 Newton. Okay, let's see another test. A rod is free to slide on a frictionless sheet of ice. One end of the rod is lifted by a string. If the rod is at rest, which diagram in figure 5.3 or ABC shows the correct angle of the string? Okay, I'll give you some time. Please pause the video until you find the answer and then you continue the video. So please pause. Okay, now I suppose you have made your choice. So what is your choice? Now, let's see how many forces are exerted on the um, rod. So number one force, it's weight. Weight. Number one force, it's weight. Number one force, it's weight. So in uh, each situation, it always has weight. Number two force is a normal force, which is supporting the rod from the surface of the ice. This is a normal force, N, 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 N. Is there any friction? No, there's no friction because this is frictionless sheet of ice. Is there any other force? Yes, of course it's tension. So that's the tension, T. That's the tension, T. And that's the tension. Okay, so now you see um, the N, W, and T in A cannot uh, balance each other because um, under these three forces the rod will go to the left because the tension has uh, uh, let's say it has a component in x direction which is going to the left there's no any other force can balance it uh, in situation B T and N they are going up W is going down, so they can balance each other. So in situation C, N is going up, W is going down, T is going up and right. There is no any other force provide any components which is going to the left. So the, uh, this rod will be moving to the right direction. So the final answer is B. Only in situation B, it can be at rest. So here's a detailed, uh, let's say, free body diagram. You see, if you put, let's say, number one or option A, if you put all the three forces um, to the mass center of the rod, you will see, let's say, this is the mass center of the rod. Let's see, you have weight, and then you have N, this is N, and then you have T, we just put put them together um, all at the mass center. You will see something like that, which is here. So the same thing for B and C. In B and C, you just put all the forces to be at the center of your uh, rod. Then you will see uh, the free body diagram of B and C. So only situation B can keep your uh, keep your rod to be at rest. Okay. Now next, a car with a mass of fifteen hundred kilogram is being towed 
at a steady speed. This is keyword. Steady speed means what? Means uniform motion. By a rope held at 20 degree angle from the horizontal. So this 20 degree, a friction force of 320 newton opposed the car's motion. What's the tension in the rope? Okay. So first of all, if it's in a steady speed, that means it's in a uniform motion. If it's a uniform motion, it's in a equilibrium. And which type of equilibrium is it? Is it a static or dynamic equilibrium? It should be dynamic equilibrium because it's not at rest, it's moving. So the net force should be zero. Okay, if you understand the net force is zero, now first let's do a free body diagram. How many forces are exerted on the car? Number one, weight. Number two, normal force. Number three, tension force. Number four, friction. That's all the forces. And we know all the four forces, they balance each other. So here is a free body diagram shows here. Now in this situation, you know the net force is zero, then the net force on x direction is zero, and the net force on y direction is zero. So let's say, first let's talk about the x direction. The net force on x direction is zero, it means T times, let's decompose T into X and Y direction, which is TX and TY. So TX plus F equals to zero. So what is TX? TX equals to T, times cosine theta. What is F? Let's just keep it here. F equals to zero. This is in X direction. What about Y direction? In Y direction, let's say N plus TY, because here that's your TY. N plus TY, plus weight equals to zero. Because weight is going down, so finally your weight is a negative number, and your uh, friction is going left, so friction is also a negative number. Now you have two equations, and let's see. These are the two equations. Um, it's slightly different from ours because nx is zero, wx is zero, because you, if you look at n and weight, n is in y direction and the weight is in y direction, so there's no x component for n or weight. So nx, uh, weight x, they're all zeros. So tx plus fx equals to zero tx plus fx equals zero, and tx equals t cosine theta. Now you have those two equations here, and we can write it down. So here he used negative uh, subtracted by f because he supposed f is positive, and here see he supposed weight is negative. In my equation, I suppose f here. Is a negative number and weight is a negative number, so I use plus. I use plus sign to plus a uh, friction which goes to the left. Here I use plus sign to plus a weight which is going down. I have considered the, the direction in F and W itself, but in the textbook, uh, he considers the absolute value of F and weight, so he, he used negative sign. But no matter negative or positive, you need to make sure 
um, the direction and the sign. So here you have those two equations. And uh, you know uh, friction, you know theta, then P equals to F cosine theta based on this equation. And you take all the numbers in, you get tension force equals to 340 newtons. Okay, so that's the solution of this question. Next, a ring seems from above is pulled on by three forces. The ring is not moving. How big is the force? The key word is the ring is not moving. That means it's in static equilibrium. Then the net force is zero. Then what's the answer? I'll give you some time to do the calculation and check your answer. Please pause the video until you finish the answer. Okay, now I suppose you have finished your answer. That's your answer. Now let's see how to solve it. You have 10 newton going up right and 10 newton going up left and this is the force going down and they are trying to calculate the force so let's see the y direction in the coordinates this is the y components of your force this is x components of your force of the 10 newtons going to up and right. And this is theta. So uh, let's say this is um, T1. So this T1, Y, T1 in Y direction equals to 10 newton times sine theta. But you have two such forces. Then you have T1y plus T2y. Let's say this force is T2. T2y equals to 10 times sine theta 2. So you have 10 times sine theta going up, another 10 times sine theta going up. So you need 20, sorry, sine theta. You need 20 sine theta going down to balance those two forces. So the answer is E. Okay, um, that's the equilibrium situation. So if the object is not in the equilibrium situation, the um, sometimes the question becomes more complicated. When it's not in the equilibrium situation, we call it in dynamic situation. So first of all, if something is in dynamic situation, then uh, the Newtonian mechanics can be expressed in two steps. The force acting on an object determine its acceleration, which is A, A equals to F net over N. This is Newton's second law. Do you remember this equation? One of the most equations we have learned in this chapter, uh, actually in this course. And the object motion can be found by using A in the equations of kinematics. Do you remember uh, we have learned three equations when something is in constant acceleration motion? I wrote it many times on the blackboard, and I believe you have uh, also written it in your notes. The three equations to describe the um, constant acceleration motions. Then combining Newton's second law and those three equations of uh, kinematics, then we can solve a lot of problems. Let's see the first example. A golfer pots a 46 gram ball with a speed of three meters per second. Friction exerts on a 0 0.02 Newton 
retarding force on the ball. Slowing it down, will her pot reach the hall, which is 10 meters away? Okay, so what's the motion like? So first of all, this ball is moving to the right, that's the velocity. And the acceleration is going to the left because of the friction. This friction will try to will try to stop the uh, ball, or uh, it's providing an um, acceleration which is against the ball. Okay, so you, now let's see uh, what do we want to do. We want to see if this part can reach the hall, which is ten meters away. Then we need to calculate uh, the starting point of the ball. Uh, from the starting point of the ball to the ending point of the ball, how long is the travel distance? We want to want to see how long does it travel before it stops. Or delta x. The delta x is the thing we want to calculate. If the delta x is greater than ten, then yes, uh, the pot can reach the hole. If it's shorter than 10 meters, then it won't reach the hole. Okay, now let's see what do we know. Do we know the initial velocity? Yes, this is the initial velocity. Do we know the final velocity? Yes, final velocity. Do you know the initial acceleration, uh, the initial uh, position? Let's say it's zero. Do you know the final position? No. We're going to calculate the final position, which is unknown. Do you know um, delta t? No, we don't know how long or how um, how long does it travel. Do you know the acceleration? No, we don't know the acceleration. However, we know the force and the mass. Then we can calculate the acceleration. If you know acceleration, initial um, position, vi, vf, then we can calculate v final, uh, x uh, final, because do you remember the third equation? So in the third equation uh, of the constant acceleration motion, we have learned v final squared subtracted by v initial squared equals to 2 times a times delta x. We know with v final, we know v initial, and we can calculate a. The only thing we don't know is delta x. Let's calculate delta x. But first, let's calculate a. So how to calculate a? Let's use the first equation in the constant acceleration uh, equations. A equals to uh, F over M. This is Newton's second law. Okay, so first let's calculate A. A equals to F over M, which is uh, 0 0.02 over 0 0.046 kilogram, but it's negative because it's uh, against the motion or to the left. So that's the acceleration. Now you have the acceleration. Um, here you know v final, v initial, and you know acceleration. Now you can calculate the delta x. Delta x equals to v final square subtracted by v initial square over 2a. And then you take all the numbers in, you get the final answer, which is 10.3 meter. So the traveling distance should be greater than 10 meters. So if her aim is true, the ball will just make it into the hole. OK, that's the solution. Now let's see next question. A car with a mass of 15 kilograms is being towed by the row 
at a 20 degree angle to the horizontal, a friction force of 320 newton opposes the car's motion. What's the tension in the rope if the car goes from rest to 12 uh, meters per second in 10 seconds? Okay, it's from rest to some velocity means it's being accelerated and the acceleration is going to the right because it's moving to the right faster and faster. So first of all, can we calculate what's the acceleration? We know um, V initial, which is from rest, means V initial is zero. Do you know the V final? Yes. It's 12 meters per second. This is V final. Do you know delta T? This is delta T, 10 seconds. You know V final, V initial, delta T, can you calculate A? Of course, A equals to delta V over delta T. Here, you can calculate delta V, and here you know delta T, then you know A at the end. Once you know A, um, then we can uh, use the Newton's law to calculate the net force because force, the net force equals to m a. Now you know a and you know m, m is 1500 kilogram. Then you know the net force. The net force should be going to the right. And then you want to calculate the tension in the um, in the rope if the car goes from rest. Okay. Now you want to calculate the tension. So first, let's see how many forces are there. You have a weight, and then a normal force. This is normal force. You have a tension. This is tension. You have friction. And the tension could be divided into two components, x components, which is Tx, and the y components, which is Ty. We know N, Ty, balance the weight. And Tx and F, which one is greater? Tx should be greater than F, because in this case, when Tx, the tension in x direction is greater than F, then the net force, this is net force, will go to the right so that the acceleration is going to the right. So finally, you get the equation of Tx subtracted by F equals to Ma. This is the net force. Net force equals to Ma. Okay, so that's the solution of the question. So first, you calculate A using VI, V final, and delta T. Once you have A, you can calculate MA, which is the net force. And you know net force equals Tx subtracted by F. And Tx equals to T times cosine 20 degrees, means T times cosine 20 degrees subtracted by F equals to MA. Once you know M, you know A, and you know the uh, F friction, you can calculate the T. That's the solution. Now let's see it. So first of all, the free bar diagram, which we have, which has been shown uh, in the previous slides. And let's see. Um, the key is in x direction, t times cosine theta subtracted by f equals to m a x, and a x equals to delta v over delta t, which is um, v final subtracted by v initial over delta t. Delta t is ten. V final is twelve. V initial is zero. So finally, get a is one point two meters per second, and take it to the equation here. You will get T equals to 
m a plus f over cosine theta. You know m, fifteen hundred kilogram. You know a, one point two meters per second square. You know f, three twenty newtons. You know theta, twenty degrees. So finally, you can calculate the tension, which is twenty three hundred newtons. That's the solution. Okay, there are several uh, more problems you can practice by yourself. Okay, mass and weight. Um, so, mass and weight, they are not the same thing. Mass is a quantity that describes uh, objects inertia. Its tendency to resist being accelerated, because we have known that if you have something which has a big mass, then it's difficult to accelerate it. If there's something which is in a small mass, it's easy to be accelerated. For example, uh, let's say uh, a table, and uh, let's say uh, compared to your cell phone. For your cell phone, it's easy to be accelerated. But for the table, you need to uh, exert a big force to accelerate it. It's because the table has a bigger weight than your cell phone. So bigger weight means more difficult to be accelerated. Weight. Weight is another thing. Weight is a gravitational force exerted on an object by a planet. And weight can be calculated by using this equation. Negative mg. Do you remember what's the value of g? On Earth, it's always 9.8 meters per second squared. This is the value on Earth. On moon or other planet, the value becomes different. This is the way of calculating weight. Uh, why it's negative? Because weight is always going down. So we add a negative sign to uh, the magnitude of the weight. So here is the comparison between mass weight. Um, so the conversion between force unit it's shown here one pound equals to zero uh, equals to 4.45 newtons and one newton equals to 0 0.225 pound and one uh, kilogram equals to 2.2 pounds and one pound equals to 0 0.454 kilograms okay now let's see an uh, example what are the weight in Newton and the mass in kg of a 90 pound gymnast and a 15 pound professor and two 40 pound football player. Okay, then let's convert uh, 90 pounds first in Newton. We know one pound equals to 4.45 newton then 90 pound equals to how many newtons we just use 90 times uh, 4.45 90 times 4.45 it's about 400 newtons and now let's convert it into mass we know one pound equals to 0 0.454 uh, kilogram then let's convert it in this way it times 0 0.454 and then finally get 41 kilogram this is a way of converting a uh, pound into newton into kilograms and of course uh, similar um, calculations can be done for a professor and player. Okay, so that's the mass and weight. Okay, uh, next topic.
the apparent weight. Okay. Um, so the weight um, of an object is the force of gravity on object. However, your sensation of weight is due to contact forces supporting you. And let's define apparent weight, W, app, in terms of the force you feel. And this apparent force or apparent weight is a magnitude of supporting contact forces. For example, if you are sitting uh, on a chair, you can feel your weight simply because you can feel the normal force from the chair. The chair is supporting you. When you're standing on the floor, you can feel your weight simply because the floor is supporting you. This supporting force is the weight you feel. But when you jump from a high position to a low position, when you are in a free fall motion, then you can't feel, feel any force, any uh, weight. Because during the falling process, actually there's nothing supporting you, so you won't feel any uh, weight, or you won't feel any apparent weight. Okay, the only forces acting on the man shown in this example are the upward normal force of the floor and the downward weight force. Let's see if the man in the elevator is moving, uh, moving up and the acceleration is also going up, then uh, the net force should be going up because net force, okay, let me uh, write it here. The net force, okay, let me uh, change the pointer option to pen. Because a net force sorry, it's a net, it's not met. Net force equals to MA. If A is going up, then the net force should go up. So totally there are two forces exerted on the man, weight and normal force. The normal force should be greater than the weight, so that's the net force is going up and the acceleration is going up. And um, in this case, normal force is greater than weight. Then the apparent weight should be greater than weight because uh, the apparent force, the apparent weight is the force uh, that is supporting you, which is the normal force in this case. So that means when the acceleration of the elevator is going up, the people in the elevator will feel uh, more uh, apparent weight than the real weight, so they feel heavier. Do you have such feeling when you are standing in the elevator and the elevator is starting uh, to go up, then you will feel your weight is getting heavier. That's the apparent weight. So here, this example ex explains why when the elevator starts to move up, you feel your weight is uh, heavier. In another case, when, let's say, when the elevator is moving up, and finally, when it reaches the uh, higher floor, it, a higher floor, and it starts to stop, it's moving up and stop. During that uh, situation, do you feel heavier or lighter? The answer is lighter. When you're moving up and the elevator is stopping, then you feel lighter. Why? Please think about it. I'll leave this question to you. Now, let's see a question here. Someone's mass is 70 kilogram. Uh, he's standing on a scale in elevator which is moving 5 meters per second. When the elevator stops, 
The scale reads 750 newton. Before it stopped, was the elevator elevator going up or down? How long did the elevator take to come rest? Okay, so first of all,、uh, the scale reads 750. The scale reads is your apparent weight, which is normal force, and another force is your weight. In this case, first let's calculate the weight. Weight equals to mg, and finally use this equation. You can calculate it's six eighty six newtons, which is smaller than normal force. Which means the net force is going up because normal force is seven fifty. So the net force is going up. So、uh, when the elevator stops and the Net force is going up, or the acceleration is going up. So, in which situation、uh, the acceleration is going up when the elevator is stopping? Let's say there are only two situations. Let's say when the elevator is moving up and it's stopping. What's the、um, direction of Acceleration, it it should be going down. So that acceleration against the、uh, velocity, so it will stop. When the elevator is moving down, how to make it stop? The acceleration should go up to make it stop. So in this situation. Uh, your acceleration is going up, and the elevator is stopping, so it must be moving down. Okay, was the elevator moving up or down? It should be moving down. How long did the elevator take to come to rest? I let's see. First,、uh, you know the initial velocity. Initial velocity is five. What's the final velocity? It's at rest zero, and you know、um, initial velocity, final velocity. Do you know acceleration? You don't know directly, but you can calculate it. Now you can calculate the normal force. You can calculate the weight. So you can calculate net force, and then acceleration equals to net force F net. Over the mass, you know the mass is seventy kilogram, so you get a. Once you know a, you know vi, v final. You can calculate how long did the elevator take. Okay, let's solve it. So this is your、um, acceleration a y equals to normal force subtracted by weight over mass. You take all the numbers in, you get. The acceleration is nine, zero point nine one meters per second square, and delta t equals to delta v over a, which is uh, uh, zero subtracted by negative five over zero point nine one. You get five point five second. So that means in five point five seconds, the elevator will stop. Okay. Weightless, weightlessness. So a person in the free fall has zero apparent weight. Weightless does not mean no weight. It just means there's no supporting force, because the apparent weight is the supporting force you can feel. An object that is weightless has no apparent weight. It doesn't mean no weight. It just means No apparent weight. For example, when something is、uh, in a free fall motion. So here, you see an airplane is going up, and it's uh, uh, let's say it's speeding up. In this situation, you will feel、um, the apparent weight is greater than your weight. You will feel heavier. 
And here, in the space station, uh, the space station is in a free fall motion surrounding the Earth. You will feel no weight. Actually, you have weight, but you you will feel no weight because the weight you can feel is your apparent weight. Okay, now let's see some examples. Uh, here are some examples you can do it by yourself. Uh, you need some calculations, but uh, it's not difficult calculation. You just uh, use the basic equations uh, and try to solve the quick questions by yourself. Okay, now let's learn uh, normal force. So we have already talked about normal force um, several times. Let's see what is normal force. An object at rest on the table is subject to an upward force due to the table. And this force is called the normal force because it's always directed normal or perpendicular to the surface of contact. Let's say if you have a surface like that, like your table, you have something on the table. So this thing will have weight and the table will give it a supporting force, which is normal force. And the direction of normal force is perpendicular to the surface. If you tilt the surface and put another object here, what's the direction of the normal force? Still, it should be perpendicular to the surface in this direction. Always a perpendicular means normal. That's why this force is called normal force. The normal force adjusts itself so that the object stays on the surface without uh, penetrating it. For example, if you put a small thing here, it has a small normal force. If you put a big thing here or heavy thing here, it will have a bigger normal force so that um, the object doesn't penetrate the surface or the normal force balance the weight. Okay, so here a 1.2 kilogram book lies on the table. The book is pressed down from above with a force of 15 Newton. What's the normal force acting on the book from the table? Okay, um, now let's see how many forces are on the book. Number one, weight. Number two, the force from the hand, which is pushing force. Number three, normal force from the table. So these three forces balance each other, so normal force equals to weight plus uh, pressing force. Normal force equals to weight plus pressing force, which is 15 plus 12, it's 27 newtons. That's the way of calculating the normal force. Okay, um, now let's see the normal force on the incline. So sometimes when there is a ramp in the incline, we can tilt or rotate the x axis in this direction to, uh, to be along the surface. And then the normal force will be in the y direction, which is perpendicular to x. And the weight is still uh, it's pointing straight down vertically. And the weight can be divided into two components, in x component and a y component. In x components, it equals to weight times sine theta. In y components, it's negative weight times cosine theta. And the y components of weight balance uh, the normal force. So that's the normal force on, on the ramp or incline. There are common mistakes when you do free body diagram on the ramp. One common mistake is on the ramp, sometimes you draw the normal force in an uh, upward direction, but it's wrong. It should be perpendicular to the surface, 
like this. In another case, sometimes you may draw the weight uh, to be perpendicular down to the surface. Actually, it's wrong. The weight is always straight down. That's two common mistakes. We need to avoid them. <clears throat> now, let's see this example. The box is sitting on the floor of the elevator. The elevator is accelerating upward. The magnitude of the normal force on the box is greater or smaller than mg or weight. No. Now you see A or acceleration is going up, which means F net or net force is going up due to the Newton's second law. If net force is going up, then let's see the free body diagram. You have a weight, which is mg. You have another force, which is normal force. So which one is greater? Of course, normal force, because normal force has to be greater so that the net force could go up. So the answer is A. OK, here, a box is being pulled to the right at steady speed by the rope that angles upward. In this case, which one is correct? I'll give you some time to think about it. Please pause the video until you get the answer. Okay, I suppose you have solved the problem and choose the, your own uh, choice. Now let's see the free body diagram. First, this box has weight, and then it has a tension, which is here. It has some, uh, maybe it has some uh, frictions, but it doesn't matter because it's in x direction. Now let's only consider y direction. So no matter it's it has a friction or not, it doesn't matter because it's in x direction. Let's see the y direction. In y direction, uh, you have ty, and in y direction, you also has a normal force. Ty plus normal force equals to weight. Then uh, Ty is um, it's going up. It's a positive number. Ty plus n equals w. So n must be smaller than w. So the option is C. OK. Now, let's solve another problem here. A skier slides down a steep 27 slope on a slope. This steep friction is much smaller than the other surface at work, and it can be ignored. OK, let's consider it to be uh, frictionless. So what's the skier's acceleration? First, let's draw a free body diagram. You have weight. You have normal force. Do you have any force? Do you have any other forces? No, because there is no friction. So the weight can be divided into two components. X components, WX, and Y components, WY. WY will balance uh, normal force so that uh, in Y direction it doesn't move. In X direction. What's the Wx? This is Sita. So that means here it's Sita. So your um, Wx equals to W times sine Sita. Wx equals to W times sine Sita. And Wx is a net force because Wy and n, they are balanced. This is your net force equals to your net force. Then you can use the net force over m to get the acceleration. So uh, let's see. 
in x direction. Um, let's see. In your x direction, you have net force equals to um, wx times nx. nx is zero because nx is in the y direction. So wx equals to ma. And um, nx is zero. wx equals to m. Um, okay, let's see. So here, actually, um, here, this equation, there's something wrong. It should be m g sin theta because mg it's the weight weight uh, times sin theta is your um, net force it equals to ma so n is cancelled this is cancelled so your a equals to g sin theta okay a equals to g times sine theta. So g times sine theta, you know g, you know sine theta, it's 4.4 uh, meters per second squared. So here, there's a mistake on our slides. Please notice that net force equals to weight x in x direction. Weight is mg, it's not m. It's mg. So here, it's mg sine theta. So m is canceled by um, here, and then g sine theta equals to a. Okay, so that's a conclusion um, on this for the skier's acceleration, but it's commonly used for any ramps which is frictionless. If you have frictionless ramp, you put something on the ramp, it will slide down, and the acceleration is always g sine theta. Theta is the um, inclined angle. Okay, next topic is friction. So we have two different types of friction, static friction and dynamic friction. Static friction is a force that a surface exerts on an object to keep it from slide, slipping across the surface. To find the direction of um, so the static friction, uh, you can decide which way the object will go if there's no friction. For example, let's see this case. The, this man is, or this woman, is pushing the box forward. And the box doesn't move. If it doesn't move, then there's a static friction. If it moves, then that's not static friction anymore. It becomes the later we will learn it becomes dynamic dynamic friction if now it's a static friction which direction is the friction exerted on the box it should be to the left because you can imagine if there is no friction then the box will move to the right however there is some friction to stop the moving so the friction is uh, to the left so remember one thing is the friction is always against against the motion. If the motion is to the uh, or the tendency of the motion is to the right, then the friction is to the left. So for this box, here is a free body diagram. It has weight and normal force. They balance each other in y direction. A pushing force and static friction. They balance uh, they balance each other in x direction. Okay, um, the static friction must exactly, exactly balance the pushing force so that the net force becomes a zero for the box, so that the box doesn't move. The harder the woman pushes, the harder the friction force from the floor pushes back. If it pushes in this way, then the friction is in, in this way. It balances each other. 
if the push force is greater, then the friction, static friction is greater to balance it. So if the woman pushes hard enough, the box will slip and start to move. Once it starts to move, the static friction um, will become disappeared and the friction becomes dynamic friction. And the moment the box uh, starts to move, uh, reaches the uh, maximum value of static friction. So the static friction force has a maximum possible magnitude, which is Fs max. It equals to mu s n. So mu s is called the coefficient of static friction. And mu s, um, the value of mu mass, mu s depends on the materials of the two objects. Okay, now let's see the static friction features. The direction of the static friction is to oppose the motion or oppose the tendency of the motion. The magnitude of the static friction adjusts itself to balance the pushing force or tension force so that the object doesn't move. And the magnitude of static friction cannot exceed the maximum value uh, of friction, of static friction. And the maximum value is given by this equation here. If the friction force needed to keep the object stationary is greater than the maximum force of static friction, then the object start to move. Okay, now let's see one example here. A box on the rough surface is pulled by a horizontal rope, which has a tension force T. The box is not moving. In this situation, let's compare the static friction and tension force. Which one is greater? Okay, the keyword is not moving. Then it's static, for, static friction. So the static friction should balance attention. Answer is B. Now, um, let's see kinetic friction or dynamic friction. Usually we call it kinetic friction. So for kinetic friction, unlike static friction, it has a nearly constant magnitude given by uh, Fk equals to mu, mu k m, where mu k is called coefficient of kinetic friction. So for example, uh, if the box is pushed slowly, uh, means it's moving already, then it will have a kinetic friction, which is Fk. In another case, if the box is pushed faster, actually the kinetic friction is the same. So the kinetic friction, it depends on mu k and n. It's independent from the speed. No matter it's faster or slow, the kinetic friction is the same. A wheel rolling on a surface also experiences friction. This is called rolling friction. It's different from kinetic friction. The portion of the wheel that contract, contact the surface is stationary with respect to the surface, not sliding. The interaction between a rolling wheel and the road is very complicated, but in a lot of cases, we can just treat it like another type of friction using the equation here. The rolling friction equals to mu rho times n. Mu, the mu rho is a coefficient of rolling friction. So in this course, we don't do any calculation for rolling frictions. So you can just uh, Take a look at this equation, and you don't have to use this equation to do any problem. Here is a list of some uh, mu uh, coefficient of frictions. So for example, rubber on concrete, uh, the static maximum value of static friction is coefficient is 1, and the coefficient of kinetic 
friction is 0 0.8, and the rolling mutation, a uh, rolling coefficient, it's uh, 0 0.02. So you see, first of all, the maximum value of static friction is greater than kinetic, and it's much greater than rolling uh, friction. And different materials have different values. For example, steel on steel, the value is smaller. Steel on uh, steel, which is wet, it's even smaller. Ice on ice, it's very small. So different materials has different uh, coefficients of friction. Okay. Now let's uh, solve several projects problems. So first of all, a box with a weight of 100 Newton is at rest shown here. It is then pulled by a 30 Newton horizontal force. Does the box move? Okay, so in order to determine if it moves, let's try to find out what's the maximum value of the um, static friction. If your pushing force or pulling force is greater than the maximum value of um, static force, then you can move it. Otherwise, it will stop because your pushing force is not greater enough to balance or overcome the maximum value of the um, static friction. So let's calculate the static friction. Fs equals to mu s times n. Here, in this case, vertically you have weight on the box and a normal force on the box. They balance each other. Weight equals the normal force. So mu s times n equals to mu s times weight. You know weight is 100, so the normal force should be 100. Mu s is 0 0.4, so finally you will get 40 newtons. So the maximum value of static friction is 40 newtons, but your pushing force is 30 newtons, so it's not enough to move it. So finally, the box doesn't move. However, you see the mu k or the kinetic friction is just uh, 0 0.2. So once the box uh, is starting to move, you just need 20 newtons to keep the box moving. Now let's see this example. Carol wants to move her 32 kilogram sofa to a different room in the house. He used a sofa slider which has a mu k equals to 0 0.08 on the carpet, under the feet of sofa. She then puts the sofa in a steady 0 0.4 meters per second across the floor. How much force does she apply to the sofa? So keyword, steady speed means uniform motion. If it's a steady speed or uniform motion, then there's no net, uh, no uh, acceleration. And if there's no acceleration, there's no net force. Net force equals to zero. Now let's draw the free body diagram. You have a weight on the sofa. You have a normal force on the sofa. Weight and normal force, they balance each other. And you have a friction and pushing force. Because net force is zero, so they balance each other too. So we want to calculate how much force she applied, which is F. Then if we can calculate Fk, you will know F because they balance each other. They equals to each other. How to calculate Fk? We can use mu k times normal force. What is normal force? Normal force equals the weight because they balance each other. So it's mu k times weight. Do you know mu k? Yes, it's shown here, 0 0.08. Do you know weight? 
you don't know it directly, but you know the uh, mass, 22 kilograms. Weight equals to mg. So you can calculate the weight, and then you can calculate fk. And the fk equals the uh, pushing force. Then you know her pushing force to the sofa. Okay. So first of all, f equals to mu k n, and n equals the weight. Weight weight equals to mg. So n equals to mg. So finally, you have mu k mg. You know mu k, you know m, you know g. So the force is 25 newtons. So the pushing force equals to the kinetic friction, which is 25 newtons. That's the way of solving the problem. Now, let's take a look at the origin of friction. So what causes the friction? So all the surfaces are very rough on a microscopic scale. If you zoom in enough, uh, if you see the floor, you will see there are a lot of, uh, uh, let's say, bumps or tips on the floor. It's not smooth at all. And the surface on your shoes, they are also very rough. So when the two surfaces are in contact, they have some points uh, in contact. When the two objects are placed in contact, the high points on each surface becomes jammed against the high points on the other surface. However, the amount of contact depends on how hard you push the two surfaces together. If you push them together hardly, there will be more amount of contacts and it becomes more difficult to slide. That's why when the normal force is greater, the uh, kinetic friction and the static friction becomes stronger, simply because when the two surface when the two surfaces are pushed together, you have more contacts. Okay. Now let's see another topic, which is drag, or drag force. So we all have experienced that if you drop a piece of paper, you will see the piece of paper is moving slowly to the ground. Or if you uh, drop, a, let's say, a feather, the feather will move slowly to the ground. Simply because there are some drag forces um, on the object from the air. The drag force is opposite in direction to the velocity. It increases the magnitude as the object speeding increase. At the relatively low speeds, the drag force in the air is small and can usually be ignored, but the drag plays an important role as speed increase. We can use a simple model of drag if the following three conditions are met. Number one, the object size is between a few millimeters and a few meters. So this condition is satisfied in most of our daily calculations. From uh, a leaf falling down to a car's uh, driving, so it's all in uh, a few millimeters to a few meters. And another condition is the object's speed is less than a few hundred meters per second. Of course, the, in daily life, most of the speed are under a few hundreds meters per second. And the object is moving through the air near the, near the Earth's surface. And then, if all the three equations are satisfied, all the three conditions are satisfied, then our everyday experience, the drag force can be written in this equation. One half CD rho AV. Rho is the density of air. A is the cross section of the uh, object. And CD is a drag coefficient. 
Um, however, the value of CD for every day is about uh, 0 0.5. So approximation of the drag force from here becomes even simpler. The drag force equals to 1 fourth um, times rho a v square. Rho is density of air, A is the cross section area, V is the speed. Using this equation, you can calculate the drag force. Okay. Um, now let's see another concept, which is terminal speed. So, do you have experience that when it's raining, you will see um, sometimes the rain is uh, hitting on the ground? Or hitting on the roof. Have you ever thinking about the speed of the the rain when it's falling down? Uh, why the speed is always like that? It's not in the very high speed or very low speed. Because the rain, when the rain is falling down, it finally will reach its terminal speed, and the speed. Uh, maintains the same once it's it's in the terminal speed. The same thing for any other object. If you drop a thing from a high enough position, at the beginning the object will speed up. When the object is speeding up, the drag force will also get greater because you see, drag force depends on v. When V is greater, the drag force becomes greater. And the drag force is opposed to the motion, which is going up when something is falling. So when something is falling, at the beginning, the drag force is small because speed is small. Then the speed becomes higher and higher. Then the drag force becomes greater and greater. And at the end, the drag force balances the weight then the net force becomes a zero. So you don't have any acceleration when the net force is zero. Then this is the uh, terminal speed. Once it reaches the terminal speed, the drag force balances the weight, and the speed doesn't change. This is the reason for terminal speed. And for an object on Earth, we can calculate the terminal speed. How? Let's see one example. A skydiver and a mouse jump from a plane. Estimate their terminal speed. Assuming that they both fall in a prone position with limbs extended, let's suppose the width of the human is 0 0.4 meters and the length is 1.8 meters. And for the mouse, the length is 7 centimeters and the width is 3 centimeters. So when the man is in terminal speed, the drag force balance the weight. So this is drag force. So here is a drag force. Here is a weight. When drag force balance weight, you will see one fourth rho a v squared equals to mg. Let's suppose uh, the f of this person is 150. Uh, sorry, it's 75 kilograms. 75. And g is 9.8 meters per second squared. What is the rho? The rho on the earth is about. Let's see. Uh, where is rho? Rho on Earth is 1.2 kilogram per um, cubic meter. And what is A? A is calculated by 1.8 times 0 0.4. So you know rho, A, M, G, you can calculate V. The only thing you don't know is V. The same thing for the mouse. You know the M for the mouse. Let's say it's uh, 20 gram. And you know the cross 
section area of the mouse and you know rho of the error so finally you can calculate v so v equals to 4 times mg over rho a based on this equation and then for human m is 75 g is 9.8 rho is 1.2 a is 0 0.72 so for human the speed, the terminal speed is 60 meters per second. For mouse, it's 20. So that's why um, if a man falls from very high position, finally it can reach the speed as high as 60. So 60 meters per second, it's uh, high enough to kill a man. But for a mouse, no matter how high it jumped from, the final or terminal speed it can reach is 20 meters per second. So it's not so dangerous. Um, if the mouse balances his body um, in a proper way, it doesn't hurt. So a mouse with its very small value of m over a, the typical survive, they typical survive from a fall in any height with no ill effect. So that's why small animals can reduce their terminal speed even further by increasing A. So usually, for example, the frog in photograph at the start of the chapter does this by stretching out its feet or something. So for small animals, they always uh, survive from a, a very highly fall. Okay, uh, that's all for uh, chapter five, but let's summarize something. So uh, we have learned several new uh, forces and we learn them in details uh, to calculate the forces. Number one, weight. Weight is always going down, it's mg. Number two, normal force. Normal force, um, has no formula to calculate the normal force. We use Newton's laws as a guide to determine the force uh, must be because the normal force balances itself to uh, to not penetrate to the surface. Spring and tension force we have learned before. Uh, static friction and dynamic friction we have learned equations to calculate the static friction and kinetic friction. They are all against um, the motion or the tendency of the motion. Drag force, it's also against the motion and we learned the equation to calculate uh, the, drag and for the drag force. Here are all the forces. Interacting objects, so it's optional. So you can read the textbook and the slides for the interacting objects. Uh, in our exams, we don't do any interacting uh, objects calculations. So this is one topic we don't uh, touch in, uh, in this lecture. And for ropes and pulley, um, it's a relatively easy. You don't need to do a lot of calculations. They are mostly concepts and ideas. If you understand the concept ideas, then you should be no problem with the ropes and pulley. So it's very good for um, for a reading pro uh, reading exercise. Please read the textbook to understand uh, the ropes and pulley. And we don't uh, explain it on class, and we don't have any exams or uh, questions in the final for ropes and pulleys. Okay, so that's all for chapter five. Um, okay, thank you. I will see you in next chapter.